songs? And these are going to be coming out soon. i 
Father God, we just want to say thank you for being faithful through all our good times, our bad times, Lord. And just uh, bringing us here, Lord. Let us be hungry for your word, Lord. And we say this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Man, oh man. Good morning, New Venture. Was that good today? Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Good morning, everyone. Go ahead and have a seat if you would real quick. What a glorious day the Lord has blessed us with. And uh, my gosh, we had an awesome time first service. We're expecting a double move of the Lord's Spirit. How many want to walk out of here with the bounce in your step and feeling better than you first walked in? Oh, me too. No doubt. We welcome you all. What a great spirit of worship. Just came back from City Church. That theater is filling up with people not out to see the latest Avengers movie, but really to get to know Jesus Christ. Man, we had worship there too this morning. They serve pancakes and sausage once a week, so everyone is eating before they worship and before they receive the word. Do you agree church was never meant to be boring? Man, oh man, I hope you feel them today. And if you are visiting today, we welcome you in the fullness of God's spirit. We welcome you this morning and pray next time you come back as an old friend of the ministry here. We really want you to do that. Several things going on in our ministry here. You're going to see in your program this little card, and this card just lets us know that you are here. I want to encourage you just to go ahead and fill that out, if you would, and then if you end up saying yes to Jesus Christ, and if you're looking for help, you're looking for hope, you want life to matter, you find it in Jesus. You make that decision, when you walk out towards the end, just drop it in and we'll go ahead and get in touch with you, welcome you to God's kingdom and uh, answer any questions that you might have. So when you leave, drop it in, the, your card, I wanna encourage you to do that. And then for all of our visitors today, we've got two of these right here, my gosh, I love these things. These are basically gifts to all of the folks who are visiting with us today. When you leave this morning, um, go ahead and take that card. If you're a visitor, just go right out to what we call the guest center, and we want to give you one of these bags, and it's got such good stuff in it. It's got this, this cool sports water bottle in it. It's got a keychain. It has got a journal. I have a short letter of welcoming you, but you'll love it. It's just our way of saying thanks for joining us, and so drop it off there, and we'll give you one of these. Get it? Great family, that is fantastic. And so many, so many great things that are going on here. Hey, would you do me a favor? Would you open up your program and pull out these cards, these little cards that are paper clipped, if you'll grab those real quick. These are the coolest things. We get a lot of people here in our church who are asking, man, I want to share what God's doing in our church. I want to invite them to church. Can't you put together? So we've heard that by several, and that's why we've come up with these. Some of you go, man, only three. When you walk out on our guest center there, if you need more, you can grab some of these. And they're the neatest things. Give these to folks you, you care about or folks you have come across and meet. It could be a, a, a waiter who gave you good service, a waitress who gave you great service, or even bad service. But leave that tip and leave one of these cards. And it's a way, who knows? I think all of us are looking for help. All of us are looking for hope. Do you agree you find it in the name Jesus? You absolutely do. Hey, there's folks looking, you know, studies have been done that they say if individuals invite someone in, North, in, in, in our country to go to church, one quarter of the people will say yes if they receive an invitation. So what a neat invitation piece. I just really love these things. And you'll notice on the back side, there is a white bar. That is for you to put, it, it, you know, if you know them, or you go, hey, if, if you need a ride, if you need anything, my number's on, and that's your number, is on the back. Leave your email address, your phone number. And if you're going, I don't mind leaving cards, but I don't want to leave my name or my phone number, that's great. Put down New Venture and put down our phone number big where they can't miss it. These are the easiest. You pray over them, you present them, and we trust the Holy Spirit to do the rest. Amen. Now we got folks sitting up in here because somebody got an invitation. The Lord said, take the net, mend the net, wash the nets, and then cast the net. And there you bring in the folks who want to come to know him. So I'm so totally excited about these. Here's one thing you do not want to do. 
You don't want to go ahead and just take these and toss them. You, you want to pray over them, keep them with you, and get them to folks, and will the Lord willing see them here. Amen? Amen? Oh, man. Why don't you put your hands together? We got a whole world of people watching online this morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Man, oh, man. And what a morning it is. Memorial weekend. You know, this reminds me of a verse. The book, the verse is in Hebrews. It's in chapter 11. And as you notice, it reads like this. You see the name of the guy. By faith, who church? By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. Then Cain did. Remember, they were brothers. By faith, Abel was commended as a, as a good guy, as a righteous guy. When God spoke well, not of his prayer life, not of his walk with the Lord, but his what? His offerings. The offering was so significant, God makes note of it. And by faith, Abel, he still speaks today in 2019, though he died centuries ago. And the saddest part, he just didn't die. He wasn't of old age. You and I know is the first example of fratricide. Frat I mean, the first two kids born into the world there was murder in the family. You've got homicide, fratricide when you take someone you know. And Abel, Cain was upset, and as you know, he slew his brother. What a terrible way to start human history. But I love this because it talks about God remembered him. Because here was a guy whose offering was significant. Well, today's Memorial Day, and this is a day we honor those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, who their offering has been their lives. And because of their sacrifice, we got Bibles on our laps. We get to worship the Lord with Diversified today. We feel the Lord here. Man, I am happy to be in the house of the Lord. I thank God for the United States of America. It is, boy, it needs help. America needs revival, but I wouldn't want to switch with any other country in the world. Whoever said, land of the free, home of the brave. And today we honor those who allow us freedoms at New Venture and across the nation, across North America. Because of them, their sacrifices on shores, villages, hamlets, all over the country in many, many wars. We got some of you here who served our great nation. We got other women and men sitting up in here who are serving the day. If you have served or are serving, can you stand a minute and remain standing? We want to, wait. oh my gosh. Oh, let's give it up. Oh my gosh. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Stay stand. Man, I love this. Oh, you know the heroes today, they don't play in Petco Park. And they didn't play when we had Qualcomm Stadium in the bolts. It's not folks with numbers on their jerseys. America's heroes are standing before us right now. Happy Memorial Day, women and men. And stay standing if you would. Thank you so very much for God allowing us to have the freedoms through your discipline, your sacrifice, your service. I know many of you today are gonna to be going to areas and commemorate those who have fallen. For many, I know this is one of the most emotional days of your year. We're all emotional because we're so glad we live in this land. I mean, I'm always thinking of J-E-S-U-S, -S, Jesus. But once in a while, I'll say USA, USA. God bring revival to our nation. Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God remains the Lord. Thank you for helping us. Let's all pray. Father God, we thank you so very much. I think we appreciate our nation, but if we are in some of these other nations with these uh, despots who run their nations with tyranny and dictatorship, thank you for the freedoms we know. Thank you for these who have served. And today we honor those who, even more so than able, paid the ultimate sacrifice as patriots of our nation. Be with the women and men who have served, 
who are serving and in all the commemorations across our land. Remind them not only of a great nation and a wonderful military, but most of all of a great God that this nation was founded upon. Lord, we'd love for revival to break out across America. We'd love for it to be here in San Diego's North County, Lord. And if there's some small way that your church here at New Venture can be a part of spreading your news, whether by business cards, inviting them to church, or through lifestyle or live, may more come to know you. Thank you for these who stand. Be with them today. Thank you for their service. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, that is great. Man, oh man. Praise the Lord. You know, um, we don't have as much time today. Dottie, are you here this service? Dottie, can you take, the, um, we so loved your last service. Dottie McGann has been in our church 23 out, out, out of 30 years. Man, she's going to be moving away. Come, come on up, would you please? And uh, man, we so appreciate her. And uh, you know, for Christians, it is never goodbye, but it is see you later. And Dottie's moving on, but she's been part of our ministry. Dottie, I know Bill's got to get his time in, but if you can just take a couple of minutes, thank you for all that you do. First of all, I want to give God thanks and honor and glory to God, our Father, and to Jesus Christ, His Son, because that's the only reason that I'm here, that any of us are here today. I thank God for this church family that I've been in for 23 years now. Many have gone on for different reasons and different ways, but God has kept me here, and I've been so blessed by my church family here and I just feel like I know I'm going away physically, but spiritually, I will be here with you. I've enjoyed being under Pastor Sean as a member because he is just a, an amazing Christ-like man. And uh, we just are so blessed to have had him to lead us and guide us, and he continues to do that with such fervor and such deep feelings for God that if you sit here and you don't get anything, that's on you. <laughs> so, so we just praise God for Pastor Sean. We praise God for the people he bring in around us to help to lead and guide us like Pastor Farrell and so many others whom he has had here. We are so blessed. I'm going to be moving to Reno to be near my daughter because my husband and I are getting older. Um, and he mentioned earlier that I play basketball at 81. But, uh, you know, God blesses me to be 81. I'm telling you what. Oh, man. <laughs> but, wow. uh, like, I called my team today and said, I won't be coming down to play today because I have something more important in my life to do, and that is to be here with my church family <laughs> as long as I can. And I thank you all for being my family, those who have prayed for me through adversities, through happy times and sad times, and those who have lifted me up and helped to carry me through those times. And God is so good. And I just pray for each and every one of you that you'll keep on keeping on. And again, I, as I said before, get into small groups. This is wonderful on a Sunday, but you want to go deeper in Christ Jesus. You want to be able to get more understanding and more in your heart and more in your spirit that's going to carry you. Because one Sunday is not enough. We need to give God more. We need to give him more time. And we can do it for the man in, on, in our jobs and in our playtime or whatever, we need to give God more too. And we need to honor and glorify him more than we do because we have things that we want him to do for us all the time. And without him, we can do nothing. So thank you all for being my church family. Thank you all for who have been in my small group that I led and for my small group that I have now. I couldn't live without all of you. And I thank God for you. And I thank God for Pastor Sean. God bless you. Thank you, God. We're going to pray you. Uh, thank you so very much. Oh, man. Man, oh, man. Isn't she great? Isn't she great? I mean, and guys, you should see her play basketball. The Milwaukee Bucks could have used her last night. <laughs> oh, would you pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you for this loving, spirit-filled, fervent, uh, so many adjectives. But Dottie has prayed for these empty blue seats to fill them up. She has filled our hearts up with the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for using her 
and bringing her for 23 out of our 30 years to New Venture. We hope she stops back by. May it always be a second home. As never goodbye, we all will meet again. That's a promise from you. We love her. We thank you for her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, Daddy. Thank you, Pastor. Love you. Love you. Oh, man. So good. That's family. Hey, can everyone stand up with me now, please? We're going to receive our offering in a minute, but turn around, say hi to four or five people, introduce yourselves. My love it. That's how church should be. Amen. Amen. A real, we hope in this hour you feel like you've connected with God and you connect with other people. Absolutely. Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let me share something with you. As good as Diversified is, um, they are a New Ventures band and they minister all over and I know you really enjoy them. If you want a great concert, man, we had the Katinas a couple of weeks ago. Diversified is, is going to be having a great concert going on the 8th. That's about two weeks away or so. When you get your tickets, you get a special care package. You get a download of their newest release. And also part of the proceeds go to help hurting, hungry people. So it's really a, man, you get a ticket, you get blessed with the music, you're able to help minister to the hurting in our community as well as getting good music. Man, can you put your hands together in advance of God gonna bless what happens? So when we're done, we hope you'll get involved in it. Absolutely, you heard Dottie talk about it. Uh, Pastor Bill's gonna come sharing a powerful word. Get involved in small groups, you can do that. And be sure to pick up your diversified uh, uh, um, ticket for the concert coming up in two weeks. Let me just share this. We're gonna receive our tithes and offerings, but here's the deal. If you are visiting here today, you are our guest. We are just grateful that you've come. And as excited as we are, I think heaven rejoices. You know, whether you're visiting or you haven't been in church in a while, if it's not New Venture, you got to get a church home, a place you look forward to coming to. You figure, I'm going to go there. I'm going to feel more encouraged, inspired. My spiritual roots are going to grow deeper. I'm going to have intimacy with the Almighty, all that good stuff. If New Venture is not the place, would you let me or one of the pastors know we would love to go ahead and get you plugged into a church nearby? We hope it's here, but if not, a lot of great churches in the area. You and I need a place we call home. Amen? I was so grateful. So visitor, if you're here today and you're from another church, please write that tithe check out at the church you normally get fed at. If the church, which I'm sure it is lifting up Jesus Christ, they need those resources to continue to minister. If you decide to give an offering here, I can sure attest to the wonderful people on staff here and the great partners. The partners are all the volunteers that makes this church go. If you went down to the north part of our campus and go into kids' world, it is a kids' world. It is, we call it God's answer to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> It is so cool. You, you guys, uh, remember that old show called Nickelodeon? And all the slime, it goes, we don't throw down slime, that we have a great time. The kids are down there, our teenagers, man, they greet you here. I just love it. Freshmen, sophomore, junior and senior hires, shaking hands as we walk in the door, saying enjoy the service. We want our teenagers to understand church is okay and be connected. And then of course we have what's going on here. Our giving, allows us to bring hope to families, individuals, and help point people to heaven. So I'm going to ask you, church family, you know the drill. This is our time, our opportunity to do something greater than us, invest in eternity by allowing us to keep meeting the needs of people. So we're going to receive our offering and then we are going to get blessed by a power message by Pastor Bill Farrell. So glad he's with us again. Let's receive. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. Lord, this is our second home. Well, actually, it's your house. We're your guests. As we give back to you now, multiply these gifts. God, I would pray. We prayed for revival earlier, earlier, Father. You can see what we can't. By our obedience, this faith, help us reach this community and beyond. We're on the march for you, Lord. We love you as we receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Bill Farrell. <laughs> God bless you, bro. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. 
So we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, if you want to find your way there. Because <clears throat> I know many of you bring your Bibles and want to follow along with what we're doing. So we're Ephesians 4. And um, this morning we're going to be talking about a phrase in Ephesians 4 that says, I, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. It's quite a statement, isn't it? A challenge to walk worthy, and, and it's an interesting statement in the Bible because it, it pulls together two uh, almost competing thoughts that we live with. The first competing thought that we live with is that all of you as individuals are important. That when God created you, he created you as an individual. That there's nobody else exactly like you, never has been, never will. And when it comes to salvation, salvation's personal. That Jesus died for you. World's most important, by world's most famous Bible verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So it comes down to a personal decision, a personal benefit to you that you can have eternal life. It's very much focused on you. Plus, you've been made in the image of God. And if you know Jesus is your personal savior, you have a spiritual gift, which means you're pretty incredible. So turn to the people sitting close to you and say, really, you're pretty incredible. <laughs> so that's thought number one, is that you, as an individual, you matter. But at the same time, you have been put into the body of Christ, and the biggest work that God does on earth is done through the body of Christ. It's done collectively. So salvation is an individual pursuit. Christian living is a team sport. And, and so we, we have to learn, if we're going to walk worthy of the calling, we have to learn how, how, how to work together. So what we do together is bigger than what we can do as individuals. And, and I want to illustrate this for you. Um, you know, we had a great time this morning worshiping with Diversify. Wouldn't you agree? I'm talented, great folks. Well, I've asked that. Would you come on back up? Diversify, would you come back up and join me? I want to illustrate this principle for you that we all are incredible, but we are much better together. So the first thing that I've asked, I've asked Leani and Havani to just share their talent with us. Uh, well, one of the songs that they led us in earlier, they, they're just going to show us what their talent looks like when it's just the two of them doing what they do well. So Havani and Leani, get us started. What happens, though, when we add everybody else in? When we bring the rest of Diversify, we bring everybody together, notice how it gets richer, notice how the, the room fills with sound when we're all together, guys. Thank you very much. God bless. Now again, when it was just one voice, it was pretty good, right? But when we add everybody together, you notice how the movement starts. Like, I don't know about you, but I could feel it. I was just like, whoo, whoo, whoo. See, and that's what happens when the body of Christ operates. Like, like this call to be worthy, it's not just about you doing your best. When I mean, we certainly want that. This call to be worthy is, how do we do it together? so that the atmosphere fills with what God can accomplish. See, that, that's, that, that's one of those things we've got to work out in our minds because as Americans, we're very individual. We, we, we tend to think about us as an individual. We tend to seek out individual pursuits. And this idea that we're in this together, we need to embrace that as much as the fact that God loves you as an individual. And that's really the point of Ephesians chapter 4. I, I call this the call of the willing because I actually believe that if you're going to walk worthy of your calling, part of your pursuit is you're going to seek, how do I get along with the people around me 
So the impact we have together is way bigger than what I could do on my own. And I think working together is actually a bigger victory than getting you to operate as an individual. It's much harder to pull a team together. Like, like those of you who are in the midst of raising a family, you know. It's a lot easier to just do your thing than to get the family to operate together. Because you start getting the family going, all of a sudden there's a bunch of wills involved, there's a bunch of agendas involved, and somehow you have to organize all that and corral it and keep the energy moving forward without discouraging everybody. It's a much bigger pursuit. That's why being part of a family, whether it's a, your family or a church family, causes you to grow. Because together, we really are better. So in Ephesians 4, we, we are, we're exposed to the key ingredients to what it means to live worthy. And we're going to take a look at them and see if we can't apply them to our lives and see if we can't uh, embrace this idea that we are better together. So the first component of a worthy walk is a supernatural unity. Paul refers to this in verses 1 through 6. Let me read it and we'll talk a little bit about it. As a prisoner of the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So folks, when you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior, it's good for you. But you also become part of this supernatural glue that holds the body of Christ together. You are now connected to people in a supernatural way. And some of the details of this is first, God's choice of you puts you in relationship with all other believers. See, when God chose you, you became part of this big collection. And you now are connected to all the believers that are alive today. And I know I, I'm amazed as Pam and I travel around and minister at different churches. It's amazing how when we meet people that know Jesus, there's this instant bond that takes place. People we've never met before. And suddenly now that we just recognize the Jesus in each other and we're like, ooh, we're in this. We can make this. And, and it's happened here in the United States and it's happened overseas. There's just this supernatural bond that takes place when you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior. But you also are connected to all the people that have come before us. So you are connected to the Apostle Paul. You're connected to Peter. You're connected to Mary. You're connected to Rahab. You're connected to Abraham and to Rebecca. All, all the Old Testament saints, all of the New Testament saints have gone before you. You're connected to all of them. And, and when your days on earth are done and you are standing in the presence of Jesus, you're going to look around and you're going to recognize those people you've been reading about in your Bible your whole life. They're going to be your friends. And the other thing that's going to amaze you is you are going to have friends who used to be people you didn't like. Because when you both come to know Jesus, there's a change that takes place and people you wouldn't naturally be friends with are suddenly now supernaturally connected to you. It goes along with knowing Jesus, folks. You have to fight it for it not to happen. Because God chose you and it puts you in relationship with everybody else that knows Jesus. And it is a supernatural connection. And you didn't make this happen. You received the calling. It was given to you. You don't have to muster. You don't have to say, Jesus, please help me like these people. No, it was given to you. And suddenly you start to view people differently. And people who lived in the flesh when they didn't know Jesus, that did things that hurt you, suddenly come to know Christ, and now you're friends. And the Apostle Paul understood this. Before he knew Jesus as a Savior, he was trying to get uh, believers arrested to the point that people in the new church didn't trust him. But when they realized his faith was genuine, they became his friends. It's a supernatural connection. And what, what ties us all together is God is only working one purpose. Now, notice how this plays out. Paul makes a point of saying there's one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling. 
Now, he's not saying here that God doesn't deal with each of us in, in, individually according to our needs. What he's saying is that the body of Christ is here for a specific reason. And folks, I've said it to you before. I will say it to you again. The only reason that God has left you here on earth, if you know Jesus as your personal Savior, the reason why he left you here is so that other people can find the hope that you have. See, if it was all about you, the moment you came to know Christ, he would just take you home. Because when you get to heaven, worship is going to be right. When you get to heaven, all your relationships are going to be right. When you get to heaven, you're going to stop making mistakes. When you get to heaven, if you have a question, you can go to the source. So the question is, why do you leave us here after we receive salvation? Well, so that we could work together so that other people can find the hope that you have. See, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So he's working in your life. Like, like some of you are in a really good season of life. And God is using your success and God is using the blessing to help other people see that God is good and that God oversees people. He looks out over people and you can trust him with your life. Some of you are going through a tough time in your life right now. Like life is not easy. Life is not good. You are going through things that make you wonder if God forgot about you. And the reason why he has us go through difficult times is so that people can see in the midst of difficulty, God is good. And in the midst of difficulty, that person is still able to smile. Like what have you got going in your life that allows you to smile in your circumstances? I need to know. Because some people need to see that so they can find the hope that you have. So God's working in all of our lives so that other people can find the hope that we have. Because if you have trouble here on this earth, but you have salvation, you're going to forget about the pain here on this earth eventually. <coughs> if you have a great life here on earth and you don't have eternal life, it's ultimately a tragedy. So see, God left you here to work in your life in such a way that other people can find hope. That's what God's about. And, and if we're honest with ourselves here in America, we tend to think it's about us. And we tend to think that if God's being good to you and God's blessing your life, then he's on his game. And if, he's not, if things aren't good in your life, you tend to think God went on vacation or he forgot about something. Because we tend to be very individualistic in the way we think. But in reality, what God's doing in your life, whether circumstances are good or bad, is he's working in such a way that other people can meet the Savior that you know. And folks, if you're here today and you don't know the Savior, God is working in the lives of the people around you to try to help you figure it out. Because he wants you in the family. Because he knows that the real action is in eternal life. Like, this earth is short. <laughs> this life here, it's quick. Amen? <laughs> like, it, it used to feel long, right? Like, like, Pam just got back from North Carolina. We did a conference back in the Charlotte area, and she got to stay for a couple of days and see one of our, a couple of our grandkids. Uh, they were there for a particular reason. So she got to spend her birthday, which is last, uh, last Tuesday, with her three-year-old granddaughter. They went swimming three times in one day. So at the end of the day, the granddaughter says to, to Pam, Nana, you're my best friend in the whole world. <laughs> Lasted one day. Because the next morning they got up, they had to confront something, so now she wasn't her best friend. But for a three-year-old, one day is a long time. Right? <laughs> you get to be an adult, that day's flying by. And so we realize the real action is the hope of eternity. And that's why God's working in our life. And he's put us together to help make that purpose work. And it's very interesting to make this unity go. There are a series of requirements. Like, like unity is a choice, but it requires certain characteristics in your life and my life in order to make it happen. And Paul makes reference to him here. The list is, first of all, humility. If you're going to get along with people... If you're going to unite with other people in a way that helps other people find hope, you have to be humble. And folks, let's keep humble, let's keep humility straight. When you say, 
oh, you know what, I, I don't really have anything to offer. I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of hanging around, just barely here. And, you know, yeah, don't worry about me because I'm just being humble. Folks, that's not humility. That's actually a form of pride because it's getting lots of focus on you. What humility is, humility says, you know what, I'm good at something. And the reason why I know I'm good at something is I, I'm created in the image of God. Right? You all are created in the image of God. Wouldn't you agree with me that if you are created in the image of God, you must be good at something? Because the image of God's pretty incredible. So you must be good at something. In addition, if you know Jesus as your personal Savior, you've been given a spiritual gift. That spiritual gift works really well because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so recognizing that, you know, I'm good at something because I'm made in the image of God and I have a spiritual gift, so of course I'm good at something. But the only reason I'm good at those is because God gave me the skill. That's humility. It recognizes, of course I'm good at something, but it's not because of me. It's because of my creator and my savior. Pride says, I'm good at this, and it's because I did it. I, I, I'm good. In fact, I might be the best in the world because I created this. That, that's pride because now you're focused on you, and you think you are your own creator. Humility says, of course I'm good at something. And of course you're good at something. And you're probably good at the thing I'm not good at. That's why we're better together. Because if I take my talent, and you bring your talent, and you bring your talent, we put them all together, now... Now we're moving. If I have to become good at what you're good at, probably not going to be that great. But if we work together, humility makes it go. Second is gentleness. See, the problem with humans <laughs> is we tend to think we're the best version. So I tend to think, well, you should just be good at what I'm good at because it's easy. And when you're not good at it, I become critical of you. Like, come on, just step up, make it happen. And because it's easy for me, because God gave me that gift, I think it should be easy for you. It's why, it's why family members tend to be so critical of each other, especially husbands and wives. Like, like a, a husband who's really good with money thinks his whole family should be good with money. So he said, well, just do this. Come on, step up. Quit being immature. And everybody else feels bad because I'm not good at that. That's why I married you. Okay, and on and on it goes. We, we could go... I, the, the things that you tend to be good at, like if you are a patient individual or you are a kind individual or, or you're a disciplined individual, you just think everybody else ought to be good at that too. And you become critical of people because they're not. Gentleness says, you know, I'm glad I'm good at some things. But if you're moving slow in those areas, I'm okay with that. If you're growing by inches, I'm okay with that. I love it when you grow by feet, and I really like it when you grow by miles. But if you're just growing by inches in some areas of your life, I'm good with that. That's gentleness. It makes room for other people to grow, and it makes room for people to, to not only be gifted in some areas, but not be gifted in other areas. And then patience. You know, I, I, I hesitate to say too much about this, because I don't want any of you leaving here this morning praying for patience. Because there's only one way to get patience. And that is to go through difficult circumstances. So I, it's not a good prayer to pray that God would give you patience. But again, what patience says is, I'm willing to wait for God to work in your life. I, I don't need you to be complete today. That, that I'm willing to let you be in process. I'm willing to watch God work in your life. I'm willing to pray for the areas of your life that need growth and development because we're all in process. And I don't need you to have it all figured out today. And, and I, I don't need, you know, again, if you're raising kids, if you're eight years old, I don't need you to act like you're 18. I, I'm willing to wait till you get there. If you're married, it, it's okay to say, you know what, we're, we're trying to figure this thing out together and we, and we have a lot of decisions to make. I'm willing to wait till we gain the wisdom to be better at this together. So patience just basically says, I'm willing to wait to watch God work and not demand that it all be done today. And then love. Love is that sense that says, you know what, if God chose you, I'm good with you. That you, I got room in my life because God chose you. If you're part of the body of Christ, that's enough for me. 
And, and I'm willing to see what God can do when we spend time together. I'm willing to see how God operates because I care about you because God cared about you. And then the Spirit. See, what we're talking about, folks, requires the power of the Holy Spirit to make it happen. You don't have enough self-discipline. You don't have enough energy. You don't have enough internal talking to yourself to get rid of all of the reasons why people don't get along together. Like, like, like don't underestimate human nature, folks. You know, Pastor Sean shared a verse with us this morning about Cain and Abel. The, you realize it took one generation. One. There was no media. There was no education. There was no cultural influence. The reason why Cain took Abel's life is it was in his heart to do it. See, human nature's corrupted. And to expect you to just somehow become better on your own and to gain the ability all on your own to love and care about people Folks, it's not in human nature. Human nature is selfish and human nature is corrupted. But you put the Holy Spirit inside an individual and you let the Holy Spirit start working? <laughs> and now we're talking about a transformed individual. Now we're talking about somebody who loves like God loves and, and accepts like God accepts and, and sacrifices like God sacrifices. And now you start to see people who care more about others than they care about themselves. That's the spirit working in people's lives, not people just being naturally good. And that's why revival is the prayer. Because when people have an encounter with Jesus, not just, I went through the religious motions of doing what my parents do, but I had an encounter with Jesus. Transformation takes place. And then finally, it takes peace. And folks, this is not the kind of peace that, well, I just feel good today. What Paul is referring to is when you know that you've been accepted by God, when you know you have peace with him, when you know that on, on the day that you stand before God as, as the judge, and he looks at you and says, hey, I, I see right here that you trusted in my son, you're good. And you know there's no condemnation, there's going to be no finger pointing, there's going to be no de being declared guilty. He's going to look at you and say, my son, my daughter, welcome home. When you have that peace in your heart, suddenly now you can accept other people. A and the peace that took place, it is remarkable. That not only did people have a sense that I'm at peace with God, but two groups of people that to say they didn't like each other is an understatement. The Jews and the Gentiles, like they were completely at odds with one another. They didn't trust each other. They, they believed that they were both evil. And suddenly now those people come to know Christ as their personal savior and they get put together in the same body of Christ. And people who didn't like each other and people who manipulated one another for their own benefit suddenly now are talking about each other like we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is a, I mean, it's phenomenal, folks, what happened. So, so they, are, they are put together, they're one body, and people now who couldn't get along on their own, not only are they getting along, but they believe they have found the most important thing on earth, and they're looking forward to spending forever together. That's what peace does. And when, when your peace with God is the biggest issue in your life, you overlook a lot of the smaller irritations that take place in life. And I want you to notice the parallel here to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Galatians 5 is a representation of what we call the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. The point here is obvious, folks. If, if you want to get along with people in the body of Christ, and you want to join together to, to fulfill this calling, you have two options. One, you can try to do it on your own. Like you can leave here today and you can say, I, I am going to get along better with people. I'm going to be nicer. I'm going to be kinder. I'm going to serve more. And I'm, I'm just going to make it happen. That is one option. I don't think it's going to work very well for you, but it is an option. The other option is you can say, Holy Spirit, rain down. And you can ask God to give you the love for other people that he possesses. 
You can ask God to give you the peace that he possesses, that causes you to get along with other people. You can ask God to give you the gentleness and give you the humility. And when the Holy Spirit gives it to you and you start to love other people the way God loves other people, suddenly what used to be impossible now becomes easy. It's your choice. You can ask the Holy Spirit to give it to you or you can try to imitate it and do it on your own. So the first part of this walking worthy is to accept that we are supernaturally unified with one another. The second thing it takes is there has to be a strategic plan. Like if we're going to work together, we have to be doing something. Like there has to be some type of plan that's moving forward. And so what Paul does is he shows us what God's plan is for causing this unity to go forward. It starts in verse 7, that God's strategic placement of you it gives you unimagined potential. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is a reference to the fact, folks, that if you know Jesus as your Savior, you have a spiritual gift. When we talk about this grace that's given you, every one of you who knows Jesus has a spiritual gift. It could be a leadership gift. It might be a helping gift. It might be a wisdom gift. It, it might be the ability to serve behind the scenes in a way that's supernaturally um, empowered. It might be a, a, a way of organizing and administrating. But every one of you has a spiritual gift. And because of that, the potential of your life, it's unimaginable. It's unlimited because it's empowered by God. Second part of the strategic plan is that Jesus assigned leadership gifts after his resurrection. Okay, if you, the, the chronology of this, Jesus dies on the cross, pays the penalty for our sins. He then raises from the dead. Forty days after his resurrection, the day of Pentecost comes, the church is born. And when the church is born, God assigns leadership gifts to get this thing started. And folks, we tend to take for granted what it means to come to church. Like you woke up this morning... And you said, okay, 8.30 or 10.30. You, you just decide which service you want to go to. And you calmly got dressed, drove here, and came to church. You, you realize that right after the resurrection of Christ, church didn't exist. There wasn't anything called the church. There was no building to go to and gather like we gather. It is a brand new work of God. And it, folks, it is dramatic. Okay, this whole thing started at the crucifixion. The, the veil in the temple got torn from top to bottom. The declaration was made, every one of you now have free access to God. You don't have to go through a priest, you don't have to go through any leader, you have free access. The implication of that is the priesthood, the Jewish priesthood that is operating throughout Israel is no longer needed. Can you imagine being the one to make that announcement? Hey, all of you that have been running the show, we don't need you anymore. Like, imagine that we sent you this week to Washington, D.C. to tell the House of Representatives we don't need you anymore. Exactly. <laughs> Do you think they would welcome you with open arms? No, they would probably run you out of town. But that's exactly what was happening, folks, is the sacrifice has been made. The payment is complete. The sacrificial system is no longer necessary, but it's all they've known. So now we've got a whole new thing getting started. And the question is, how do we get this new thing going? Well, there were, there were four different leadership gifts that God gave to get this moving. They're referred to in verses 8 through 11. This is why it says, when he ascended on high and took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Uh, jump forward to verse 11. So Christ gave him, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Okay, four groups of people that were given at the beginning to get this new thing started. The first one is apostles. Apostles were the ones who would start the church. Again, we've got this brand new thing started. Nobody knows what the church is at that point. They don't have uh, any, any type of organization and there's no structures to meet in. So we have to start this thing called the church. So we gave apostles. And apostles are always, they, they tend to be driving individuals. They, they are very focused. They, they don't respond to criticism much. Like you can criticism and it just empowers them. They're like, oh, we must be doing the right thing because people are upset. 
and and it drives them forward. So the apostles were able to teach with authority, to present with authority, and were unswayed by the criticism of the day. And God used them to get this church started and to get it on its feet. Second, he gave them prophets. Prophets would teach the church while the New Testament was being written. See, again, you and I take it for granted. We pick up our Bibles. I tell you, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You either pull out your phones, you pull out your Bible, you go find Ephesians 4. Well, if, if you said that in the first century, if I said, hey, turn to Ephesians 4, they would go, what are you talking about? Because they didn't have the New Testament yet. So God had prophets show up who would teach the New Testament truth to this new church before the New Testament was there. We now have the advantage of we can study the New Testament, we can work through it, we can apply it to our lives. They did not have that advantage. So prophets made it happen. Third group were evangelists. The evangelists are there to lead large numbers of people to Christ. And this is, this is your pastor has this gift. Pastor Sean, he's an evangelist. That, that when he shares the gospel, people just respond. And it's an amazing thing to watch. And throughout church history, God has raised up evangelists so that large numbers of people would give their hearts to Christ and, and populate the body of Christ. All of us are called to do the work of an evangelist, but if you don't have the gift, there's a small reward. You know, a few people respond. If you have the gift, larger numbers of people respond. So God gave evangelists. And finally, he gave pastors and teachers to shepherd local congregations. Because as this new thing gets started, local congregations start to sprout up. And different cities start to get different churches. Each of those churches needs leadership. And, and God gave pastors and teachers to teach those local congregations and to watch over them. The big question is, so what is the purpose of all this? Why is God providing all of this leadership? And a couple of possibilities. He could be providing leadership to put leadership on display. Because we all like celebrities, right? <laughs> we, we like to go, oh, look at that person up front. Woo, let's celebrate them. That is a possibility that we're just creating superstars. The other possibility is we're raising up leaders to train other people. And it's very clear in verse 12 and 13 that the real purpose is to train up the entire body. So verse 12 and 13, I'll start in verse 11. So Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Folks, the reason why God provides leadership is to train you. Because you're the real players. You're the ones doing the real work. You're the ones passing on the real influence. It's why God trusts parents with kids, because parent, uh, kids need parents to invest in their lives. It's why most of the real work in people's lives happen in small settings. That, that when you're in a small setting where you get to talk about what's going on in your life, and you get to ask questions, and you get to share your wisdom, lasting change happens in people's lives. Like, I'd be the first to tell you that Pam and I's greatest research for the ministry that we do for couples came from talking to couples like you. We would just ask you, how does it really work? Like, how do you make decisions as a couple? How do you raise kids? How do you resolve conflict? What do you do when you're really upset with each other? How do you keep romance alive? What habits help a marriage move forward? We learned it all from you. We just asked people who were living real lives and got real wisdom from people. That's what people primarily need. See, a lot of you have that wisdom. Some of you have great wisdom into how finances work, and people need to know what you know. Some of you have just incredible wisdom in how relationships work. Other people need to hear what you have to share. Some of you just know what it means to be faithful. Like, like it's, it's really interesting in my family, uh, my parents are both 90 this year. And because in my family, there's a trend when people get married, they break their relationship with their parents. Nobody in my f current family knows how to get old. So it's helpful to talk to people who've been there and say, how do you do? Like, is this normal? What, what helps? What doesn't help? How, how much of this do I give into? How much freedom do I give? I just, it's good to talk to people because some of you just get it. 
And, and this is one of the big reasons why you keep hearing about small groups. We're, we're not looking to just get you busier. We, we, we didn't look at the calendar and say, you know what, these people have a free night. We better get them busier. <laughs> no, the reason why we want you in small groups is for two reasons. One, so that when you're in a period of growth, you have a place to go talk and ask questions. The other reason is we want you sharing your wisdom with other people. Because there's a real problem when you don't share what you know. And I'll just illustrate this with Pam and I. Okay, Pam and I are at that stage in life where our, in our home, it's just Pam and I. When Pam and I share with other couples, like when we're engaged with other people and we're helping them to kind of process what it is we've already been through, we tend to have a great appreciation for our marriage. Because when I see what other people are going through and I see what God has done in our relationship compared to what we see people struggling with, I look at my wife and say, wow. God's really done a great work, and I am very privileged to be married to her. If I stop sharing with other people, and I only spend time with Pam and I, and, and I start to evaluate Pam and I just against the two of us, I start to look at her and say, man, she's really spontaneous. And she just messes up everything. You know, I like things planned. I like things in order. She just, all these spontaneous ideas, just runs the next, uh, next opportunity. And I can start to get irritated over a really good trait in her life because I'm not comparing it to anything else. So when you have wisdom and you have life experience and you are sharing it with other people, you tend to keep focus on what God has done in your life and you gain this great appreciation. When you don't share it with anybody else, you start to become critical of your life. And, and it, it, it happens in marriage, but it happens in all areas of life. So we want you involved in small groups so that those of you who have wisdom are sharing it with other people because it benefits them, but it also benefits you. It keeps your perspective straight. Because again, life's a team sport. Some of you are like me, you're a basketball fan. I, I grew up playing a lot of basketball. It, it was my... Uh, it, it was my refuge away from kind of the craziness in my home. I just played a lot of basketball. And if I was a, if I was a foot taller, I probably would ha have made a career of it. But, you know, that's how it is. Well, we're all into the NBA Finals right now. And it was interesting. I heard a guy say this week on the radio, I didn't realize how much it would affect me to have an NBA playoff that didn't include LeBron James. Now, for those of you who know base, uh, ba basketball, you know, LeBron James is arguably the best basketball player on the planet. For those of you who don't know basketball, LeBron James is arguably the best basketball player on the planet. Now, there's some debate about whether he's the best, but he's certainly in the debate for the top three. Last year, he was traded from the Cleveland Cavaliers to the Los Angeles Lakers. Everybody thought, we've got LeBron. There's no stopping us now. The problem is the team didn't play well enough to get LeBron into the playoffs this year because he couldn't do it on his own. He needs the team. He needs the right coach. He needs the right trainers. And it's a good reminder for us in the body of Christ that yes, you are incredible. You may be the best at what you do, but you need the team around you to accomplish the goals that are on our heart. So the strategic plan is to get everybody growing. And, and ladies, I want to just personally invite you on June 13th, um, Pam is going to do a book release party right here at New Venture Christian Fellowship. She's written a new book with two other ladies called Discovering Joy in Philippians. It is an in-depth Bible study put together with a devotional and paired with what we call creative biblical expression. So it's using art-type expression to help you engage with the Word of God and, and make it more memorable. And for all of you ladies here at New Venture, Pam has free tickets for all of you to come to the event, which you can pick up in the back this morning. So she would like to invite you. And the reason why we write books and we do events like this is we want to train you to handle God's Word effectively. Like We love teaching God's Word, but we're more excited when you are able to share what you are learning with other people uh, because it affects them in a way that's life-changing. So I encourage you to, to join the event to June 13th. We would love to have you there. Which leads us to the, um, the last characteristic of the call of the willing and this worthy walk is that there's strength in numbers. In Ephesians 4, 14 through 16, we read, So then, 
we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become the, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So folks, God intends to make his entire family strong through the contribution of each of its members. Stability comes from a corporate commitment to truth and a strong connection to Christ makes all the connections strong. And again, folks, we live in a deceptive world. And what keeps us strong in the midst of it is when we help one another. Again, I, my wife and I have been authors now for a few decades, and one of the big truths of writing is every book needs an editor. Every book I've written has been edited and edited intensely. I've had the opportunity to edit other people's work. And there are a number of books out right now that in editing them, we found some significant mistakes. Because that's the way we as people operate. You know, when you just get on a roll and, and you start sharing and you, you start, you get excited about what you're saying, you just like add more words and add more words, pretty soon you say something you wish you hadn't said. And it isn't that you meant to, it's just you were on a roll, and you got all excited and you, for a moment you didn't watch over what you had to say and you blurted something out that you wish you hadn't said. Same thing happens in writing. As you get on a roll, you get all these ideas coming and all of a sudden you just put something down and you just keep moving and when somebody else comes in and reads and go, oh, did you really mean to say this? That's what editors do for writers that keep the writing high quality. And folks, the reality of life is we all need to be edited because we're all imperfect. And when you are connected in the body of Christ, there's strength in numbers. That at times somebody will just say, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. <laughs> Think about what you just said. Rephrase it. Whoa, 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 think about what you're about to do. Rethink this. And just that moment of slowing you down adds strength to your life. So that you say and do what you intended to do rather than just run past your own discernment. Folks, we're all in that boat. And it's okay. We just need each other. And that's why <clears throat> we want to help move this thing forward. So I, I want to challenge you. Three things that I want to challenge you to do this week. First of all, I want to challenge you to engage with your small group as a display of unity. If you are in a small group, meet with them this week. If you're not meeting, call them this week. And, and just connect and engage with your small group because God works when we connect with one another. And if you are not in a small group, I want to challenge you to go to the back this morning. In the family room, we have small group facilitators who have room in their groups who are just waiting to talk to you. You can actually go interview them. If you interview the first one, you're like, eh, not really. You can move to the next one. And you can talk to the next one, and you can find a group that fits who you are and your personality. Because, folks, you do realize you are one conversation away from meeting your next best friend. Might happen this morning. So they're ready. They're ready to talk to you. And if you're not in a small group, we can get you connected this morning with real people. Not, not putting your name on a list and hopefully somebody's going to call you. You can talk to somebody face-to-face -face, decide if you want to be in their group because we want to make it happen. And if you are interested in facilitating a small group, Pastor Will is in the back, and he would love to meet with you. He's got a whole plan for how to, how to train you. The training is very simple, and the process is very simple. Like, if you are in church or you watched online, you have 10 minutes in your car that you can uh, devote to training. And if you can walk by the small group center and pick up your packet for the week, we can have you ready to facilitate your small group. If we figured out how to make it happen, and if you're interested, talk to Pastor Will. Next thing, ask God to show you something you can either say or do this week that will help someone else be stronger. Because every time you help someone else get stronger, you become stronger. And third, pray for the leaders who help you grow spiritually. God has put some people in your life that help you figure out your relationship with Jesus. And whoever those people are, pray for them this week that God would empower them. Right? Because um, <clears throat> our goal for you is to be the strongest individual you can be 
who is connected with other people so that together you're even better. That's what we're trying to make happen so that you can fully enjoy your relationship with Christ and people around you can find the hope that you have. And now would you stand with me, please? As we close, there's a couple of things I want to do. The, the first, if, if you have never trusted Christ, and we talked about if you know Christ, you have a spiritual gift and the hope of eternity, and maybe all that's been irritating to you this morning because you don't have that hope. If that's you, I want to give you the opportunity this morning. And so can I just have everybody bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you're here this morning and you're willing to admit, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, but I really want to. I want today to be that day. Would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Bill, I want to trust Christ as my Savior. I, I want to know that if, I, if this were my last day on earth, I would stand before God with peace because I trusted him as my Savior. Yes. Yes, very good. Okay, and those of you who, who, who have that desire, either online or here, right now in your heart, would you just say, Jesus, it's my turn today. I know I've fallen short of who you created me to be. I've said the wrong things, done the wrong things, thought the wrong things, and I believed I could get through life without you. And I'm sorry. But thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. Thank you that you rose from the dead so you're alive. And now come into my life. Forgive me for all that I've done wrong. Give me eternal life as a free gift. And begin today making me the person that you want me to be. And now for the rest of us in the room, if there's somebody in your life that you, you just want to say, God, would you give them strength this week? If you would just raise your hand to represent that person. Jesus, with all these hands raised, I pray that you would reach into the lives of the people that these hands represent. Would you give them the strength that they need this week? Give them the wisdom that they need this week? And connect them with somebody in your body who will speak words of life into their heart. So we commit all this to your grace and we pray you would do through each of us what is beyond us so that your name might be better known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, as you head out for the week, prayer partners will be up here in the front. If you have anything you need to be prayed for, come on forward. If you pray to receive Christ, come tell somebody. And folks, enjoy your time in your small group and may God be a transforming force in your life. God bless. <laughs>